Welcome back now to Women's Worlds of Native America and Africa, Part 2. This is our continuing discussion of women in history, in particular women who will come to be part of the great exchange of cultures known as the Columbian Exchange uh, in the Western Hemisphere, in the region we know as the Americas, uh, and in particular, what will uh, ultimately be the United States of America. But this is the before picture. This is uh, the story of women's worlds, both before the arrival of the Europeans, uh, that is of Native American women, but also, uh, as we'll see here in part two, of African women as well, all of whom will, along with European women, make up the basic uh, mix of cultures and histories uh, that will create what Europeans called the New World. And so we turn our historical spotlight now on Native American women. We've already seen how deep the roots of Native American civilization went before the arrival of Europeans and just how important women were in a general sense to those civilizations. We'll look now at a couple in particular. First, the southwest of what is now the United States or the Four Corners region of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, along with the neighboring regions, both in Mexico today and Texas, Nevada, California. So an expansive region we generally refer to shorthand as the southwestern region of the United States and northern region of New Mexico. The second of the two groups we're going to look at are regions, uh, geographical groupings, are the eastern woodlands uh, and in particular the peoples who made up the Iroquois Five Nation Confederacy. The Iroquois Five Nation Confederacy. On the map we see what is now in effect New York State, Upper New York State along the banks of both the uh, Great Lakes Erie and Ontario. Uh, where the so-called Five Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy uh, were well established by the time of European arrival. In both cases, as we'll see, uh, it is the labor and influence of women that will play a key role. But we start here with the Pueblo uh, peoples. This was a Spanish uh, name, a Spanish adjective, Pueblo, that referred to the adobe structures that were familiar uh, to the native peoples of the southwest, the mud-baked uh, structures that made up the various communities and towns, the so-called pueblos of the native people. Uh, what they called themselves uh, changed throughout time. Uh, it was until fairly recently uh, correct to refer to the more ancient of the peoples, that is the pre-Columbian southwestern peoples, as the Anasazi. But the word itself is a modern Navajo word, and so it doesn't get us any closer necessarily to understanding what these uh, peoples referred to themselves, how they referred to themselves. Uh, and so we still use the Spanish name. Sometimes we add to it the ancestral Pueblo peoples if we're talking about, again, those uh, pushing back the timeline a bit farther who lived in the, de the southwest region prior to the arrival of Europeans. And that's the, the chronology that we're going to employ here to begin. What you see is a picture of Again, the Spanish named Pueblo Bonito, uh, the largest of the Pueblo towns, historical towns located in the Chaco Canyon region of northern New Mexico, as it might have looked at its height around the year 1000 
CE, that is roughly 500 years before the arrival of Columbus to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it is a, a digital recreation based on the ruins of Pueblo Benito, uh, but as such it gives us some idea of the complexity again and sophistication of the civilization that was created in what we call the Four Corners region of our nation centuries before the arrival of Europeans. What can we say about the Pueblo peoples uh, beyond their complex culture? Uh, they were uh, diverse. Uh, they made up not a single group or a single language group, but seven different languages spread across the settlements or pueblos of the southwest, the Four Corners region from northern New Mexico into what is now the Four Corners region of the United States, as far west as California, as far east as Texas. We know them now because of what they left behind, including the beautiful and intricate tradition of ceramic uh, pottery, uh, fragments of which uh, survive in the museums uh, of the world and uh, which have been uh, excavated or saved or uh, maintained these traditions over time. We know them from the agriculture they practiced, uh, particularly the maize or corn agriculture that they uh, inherited from Mexico uh, millennia ago now. We're talking not just centuries ago, but millennia, uh, that is thousands of years, uh, this tradition of agricultural borrowing, particularly maize agriculture. And just as now, the region then was rather arid and dry, and so they developed, uh, as we do today, irrigation systems to bring water from the major rivers and tributaries, particularly the Colorado River, into the otherwise uh, very dry lands of the Southwest. Climate does change over time, but nevertheless, it was necessary for irrigation that is man-made irrigation systems to be uh, created in order to foster the agricultural traditions of the Pueblo peoples. Uh, in addition to being food growers and food producers and food uh, traders, they were also a commercial people who established, as we'll see, rather far-flung trading networks uh, in which hand-crafted uh, goods uh, were traded throughout the Pueblos and along the rivers uh, all the way into uh, into central Mexico, across the Sonoran Desert and the Sierra Madre Mountains, into the highland uh, uplands of central Mexico. Uh, they were town builders, uh, as we'll see, and as such, developed sophisticated architectural traditions, including, again, uh, the Chaco Canyon, uh, or gem of the Chaco Canyon, what seems to have been perhaps the largest of the Pueblo uh, settlements, the so-called Pueblo Benito is the Spanish name referred to it. The familiar stylings then of both their pottery and their architecture uh, remind us still to this day of their uh, great accomplishments, material accomplishments. The arid southwest was the center in particular of a profitable turquoise trade, a network of political and trade connections across an area covering 57,000 square miles, including Chaco Canyon, radiating outwards from Chaco Canyon in northern New Mexico uh, across 57,000 square miles was the great trade nexus, including the turquoise trade, uh, that enriched the peoples of Chaco Canyon. Uh, in the trade of the precious stone, both turquoise and actually argillite, its cousin, uh, vibrant in color from the familiar turquoise blue to the bright orange that mirrored the sandstone mesas of the southwest. Uh, these stones were mined from the earth by laborers, uh, were finished by polished gemsmiths, uh, and as I say, became then part of the 
basic trade that fueled the growth of commerce and travel and connection across this vast territory uh, centuries before the arrival of Europeans. Uh, a geography of trade and settlement. You can see this modern day map showing the Four Corners region, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and some of the modern towns uh, noted on the map, such as Durango, Colorado, and Farmington, Utah. Uh, but also noted on the map uh, then are the trading posts and uh, town settlements of the uh, Pueblo peoples spreading across this region along with the network of roads uh, that made up the actual trade connections. Uh, so patches of dense settlements and markets connected by rivers and a system of roads, sometimes these constructed roads up to 12 yards wide crisscrossed and transverse the uh, large area of trade and settlement and exchange created by the Pueblo peoples. Uh, much of what remains just in terms of the ruins of the architectural ruins still uh, have the capacity to take one's breath away. And underlying all of this activity, of course, uh, was labor, that is work, uh, and in particular a gender division of labor uh, between men and women. Specialized tasks, men uh, were the defenders of settlements. Uh, they were hunters who uh, sought game uh, to supplement diets. Uh, they also carried out much of the trade over land, while women uh, worked within sophisticated trading communities locally to support and provide for the basic material necessities uh, of the people themselves. And again, in this sort of stylized artist depiction, you can see uh, those various tasks represented from farming to hunting to manufacturing uh, and domestic work, uh, architectural work. Here's the real version, or at least uh, the ruins, uh, from Mesa Verde, so-called Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde, Colorado, which is now a national park of the United States. Uh, this settlement was built into the crevasse of a sheer canyon wall, hundreds of feet above the canyon floor. Uh, the wall itself sat on top of an enormous mesa, a great mesa in southern Colorado uh, that was uh, home to the ancestral Pueblo people centuries before European arrival. Uh, part of that same spread of civilization and migration that we've seen now across the Four Corners. And when you visit Mesa Verde, you are immediately confronted with the extraordinary skill and capacity of these people to create architectural wonders uh, in the sandstone mesas and cliffs, uh, often uh, inaccessible otherwise uh, to moderns. You know, we, we can visit them now because stairways have been built and access roads and such. Uh, but for the uh, ancestral peoples, it was all much more basic. Uh, it was ropes and ladders and sheer um, force of determination and creative imagination uh, that led to such places as um, as Mesa Verde, uh, which uh, is one of the great really wonders of the world in terms of its architectural um, sophistication and architectural inspiration. But within these uh, stellar uh, settlements and communities uh, were ordinary people. Uh, the lives of Pueblo li uh, women, for example, uh, the daily uh, tasks, uh, both domestic and commercial, supported and extended that Pueblo trade economy. Traditions of skilled craft work, including textiles and weaving, basket weaving in particular, and of course the pottery meant that Pueblo women were at the center of both the local economies, uh, domestic and commercial, but the, uh, the more far-flung trade economies uh, as well. If we change our geographical focus now from the arid southwest to the wooded northeast of what is now the United States, we can see uh, the peoples known as the 
Iroquois, or as they are sometimes more commonly now these days known as the Haudenosaunee. And the Haudenosaunee, uh, or Iroquois, were among the most politically sophisticated uh, of the tribal networks of North America. Uh, even before the arrival of Europeans, the great five nations of the Seneca, the Cayuga, and the Onondaga, along with the Oneida and the Mohawk peoples, who joined together in a political and economic confederation uh, to marshal their resources and their capacities, uh, became one of the uh, the great um, sort of ruling paradigms of North uh, America. And at the heart of this story, the uh, the mythic or folkloric heart of this story, the epic of Deganwida, uh, that is the, the, the coming together of the Iroquois nation, is a story that tells that the Iroquois found peace only after generations of fierce fighting, could find peace only after the women called for an end to war and retaliation, the pitiless cycle of war and retaliation. According to the Epic of Degen Vida, a new council arose consisting of chiefs drawn from the five nations, that is, each of the tribes who were selected by women. And in the mythic telling of this story, one woman in particular uh, rises above others, Jakansase, uh, or Mother of Nations, revered as the unifying figure, uh, the ma ma maternal and unifying figure of the Iroquois Confederacy. And it's true that the lives of Iroquois women were central uh, to the success uh, and enduring strength of the Iroquois Confederacy. The Five Nations featured societies that were often matrilineal, that is, in which uh, basic status and identity and property uh, fell through the mother's line, inherited through the mother's line, rather than the patriarchy of European states. A land-based society where agriculture, that is the production, the food production of the local economies was central to the sustenance of the people, but not only as agricultural laborers then, but also as political voices, Iroquois women held great influence as they did over the long-standing traditions of religious worship and spiritual practice. This work of art here you see, the so-called three sisters of corn, beans, and squash, the staple of the Eastern Woodlands diet, uh, agricultural diet, viewed as the very enablers of life for the Iroquois. The three sisters, again, the matrilineal uh, and matriarchal sense of the basic structure and the, uh, the sinews holding together uh, the peoples of the Confederacy. And again, we find the gender division of labor uh, present uh, agriculture, largely a woman's world uh, of, of not only providing uh, food uh, for sustenance, for eating, but also plants and herbs for healing uh, and nurturing, whereas the men's world tended to be the world of animals, hunting, and war. To live among us without a wife is to live without help, without wandering, or without home, and to always be wandering was a a uh, familiar adage, a traditional adage or proverb. So it was uh, the idea of, of rootedness to a family a community that uh, gave the veneer of civilization to the peoples of the Iroquois Confederacy. And Europeans were quick uh, to point this out as well. Scenes of Native American women uh, at work were uh, eagerly sketched by, sketched by early European uh, visitors and enthusiastic accounts uh, such as this one from the uh, f uh, French uh, uh, 
Jesuit, Joseph Francois Lafitte, in 1724. The women are busy going to get the vessels, which are already full of the sap which draws from the trees, wrote Lafitte, taking the sap and pouring it into the kettles which are on the fire. One woman is watching over the kettles while another one, seated, is kneading with her hands this sap which is thickening and in condition to be put in the shape of sugar loaves. Beyond the camp in the woods appear the fields as they look at the end of winter. We can see the women busy putting the fields into shape for the first time and sowing their corn. So the entire network of labor from the fields to the preparation to the cooking, uh, that is the sustenance uh, of life itself, uh, depended on the, uh, the labor and positioning of women. And this is something that quite impressed Europeans like Lafitte, who again are coming from patriarchal societies. Even Columbus, on uh, his second voyage to the Western Hemisphere, remarked, quote, the women seem to work more than the men. Another observer, Sebastian Raleigh, in 1723, when the men are not at games, feasts, or dances, they remain quiet on their mats and spend their time in either sleeping or in making bows, arrows, calumets, and other articles of that sort. As for the women, they work from morning until evening like slaves. And I guess I'm tempted to say that, well, some things never change. <laughs> a basic acknowledgement of power. Once again, Lafitte, the French Jesuit, nothing, however, is more real than the superiority of the women. The land, the fields, and their harvests all belong to them. They are the souls of the councils, the arbiters of peace and of war. They have charge of the public treasury. To them are given the slaves. They arrange marriages, the children are their domain, and it is through their blood that the order of succession is transmitted. So Lafito here acknowledging not only that the, the physical labor, uh, the agricultural labor, the domestic labor is performed by women, but much of the spirit of the political authority and sovereignty of the people also came from women. But as we know, with the arrival of Europeans, beginning with Columbus in 1492, there would be a great collision, cultural, political, military, economic collision of hemispheres that would devastate the worlds of Native America. And what we should acknowledge, that women were often at the center of this calamitous collision. We know some of the stories, uh, be they legends or folk tales or authenticated histories. The stories of women who come now into focus with the European arrival. Women who become known as individuals uh, by name or names given them, such as La Malinche. And La Malinche uh, is a native woman of Mexico, uh, a Nahuatl a woman of Mexico who becomes woven into the very narrative of Spanish conquest uh, and has been ever since uh, an enigmatic figure, a woman who has often been has been, been blamed uh, for the catastrophe of the Spanish conquest, just as she has been singled out uh, as a woman, uh, a heroic woman who did what she could to defend the interests of her people. Yo soy la Malinche. My name, uh, I am Malinche. My name is Malinche. Uh, but that name came to mean different things. And in this passionate bit of prose written by the modern uh, Latina uh, poet, you can see here uh, the uh, sort of conflicted uh, tale of one woman's agency. Uh, at a time of great conflict. For I was not a traitor to myself. I saw a dream and I reached it. Another world, la raza, the race. That from Carmen Tafoya, uh, a modern Latina poet whose work La Malinche gets at the heart of this complicated story 
of a woman who became the consort of Hernán Cortés, the conquistador himself, uh, who became a translator, an interpreter, and who accompanied him. Uh, we have to remember that in the context of the day, something like a relationship between a man and a woman, especially among the hyper-Orthodox Spanish Catholics, was never simply a matter of romantic choice. Uh, the woman we know as La Malinche uh, uh, was certainly not uh, uh, a free agent in any of this. Uh, as others were, she may well have been taken by force by the Spanish, uh, forced to do the work of translation, forced to be the consort of Cortes himself, and in so uh, being forced was then associated in the historical imagination with the Spanish conquest. Yet another enigmatic woman uh, or female identity, of course, that of Pocahontas uh, in the Atlantic coast of North America. The story of Pocahontas has so often been told and retold, whether it be from Hollywood or Disney, that it's easy to lose the historical thread. But one thing I would suggest about the Pocahontas tale is that the story as we know it from history, that is the pre-Hollywood, pre-Disney story, the historical source of that story was a man, John Smith. Uh, and so, as it would often be the case, a woman's identity was left to the mercy of a masculine reporter. John Smith was an English adventurer uh, and um, a man of, of commerce, a man of, of military background who was part of the English visitation on the, the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's worth noting that he added the story of Pocahontas only in successive tradition or editions rather of his history of, of Virginia. The part about Pocahontas saving him from the executioner's blade, for example, was a late add to a later edition of one of Smith's own stories. So even here, it's hard to unravel the complicated uh, tale and to separate myth from from fact, like. Alinche, we know the Europeans viewed Pocahontas uh, as a converted Christian, just as Malinche had converted to Catholicism or been forced to convert, so too had Pocahontas, uh, and in their eyes at least, thereby redeemed from the pagan cultures of which they were born. Uh, this always reinforced what we like to call a white messiah complex among European Christian colonizers, especially European Christian males who were seen as saviors of these these native people. Even though in, in Smith's retelling, it was Pocahontas who saved him. In the larger telling of the story, it was the Europeans, the Christian English or Spaniards, who saved the women uh, Malamalinche and Pogantis from their, uh, you know, pagan um, uh, savagery. Uh, an obvious editorial bias, you might say, by the Europeans. And what we'll see as we move from Native American worlds to African women's worlds, that sort of bias will carry over uh, to Africa as well. So the complicated intersection of women's lives in the Western Hemisphere, from European and Native American to African, will create stories and traditions of telling stories that find their way into the history books of mostly Anglo-Americans that often carry with them the bias and, and implicit assumptions about civilization and non-civilization. But again, we would want to be on the lookout for that sort of bias and not simply accept these tales uh, at their face. And so one of the things we have to do when we think about Africa and African women is get our minds around the complexity and vastness of the African story. Even if we take only West Africa, the region from which most of those who will be forced to migrate to the Western Hemisphere 
come. Even if we take West Africa, we're dealing with a vast region that stretches 3,000 miles from the Senegal River uh, in the northern part of West Africa, where the the uh, Sahara Desert meets the grasslands of West Africa, uh, to the Congo River, uh, deeper into the southern part of the African continent below the equator. So a 3,000 mile stretch from north to south, creating a littoral or coastal region that we call West Africa. And not just jungle. I mean, never mind what the Tarzan stories of the European and American imagination would convey. The peoples of West Africa, by and large, did not live in jungles, but rather, uh, that is, in equatorial jungles or rainforests, but rather in grasslands and uh, alpine forests and coastal stretches where farming, manufacturing, and trade had to find everyday life for not just centuries, but thousands of years. So yeah, roughly from where the Senegal River would be if it were on this map, 3,000 miles south to the Congo River, where the Congo River meets the Atlantic. This is the great region of West Africa from which the majority of peoples uh, will be taken now as part of the Atlantic slave trade in the age of European conquest, taken and uh, and and against their wishes and will uh, embedded into the traditions of the Western Hemisphere. To think of West Africa is to think of great diversity, of diverse people. A single word Africa, let alone African, cannot begin to cover the diversity of culture and language and practice among the peoples of West Africa. It is the Europeans who will impose their own cultural uniformity on the peoples of West Africa, mostly be, well, two reasons. One, because they knew so little about them, it was easier to generalize, uh, it was easier to stereotype, and two, because the Europeans will establish that most destructive of global trades known as the Atlantic slave trade, it was easier to simply make uniform the peoples upon whom they were uh, now going to impose this dreadful sentence of enslavement in the West. But diversity, diversity is of West Africa just what it is of Native America, just what it is of Western Europe, just as we would not seriously confuse, say, the Spanish with the uh, Dutch or the Dutch with the Poles or the Poles with the English. So too, if we only had a greater appreciation and sense of the history of West Africa, would we not try to impose cultural uniformity on the peoples of West Africa? Because no such uniformity existed. West Africans were as culturally different from one another as Europeans with diverse customs, languages, and gender traditions. And when you look more closely at these cultures, what you find are cultures that were often predicated upon the inspirations and labors of women. Ancient traditions of textile weaving, for example, and textile coloring, each uh, region claiming its own styles and dye techniques will be one of the grand artistic accomplishments of West Africa. Uh, down to this this day, uh, as peoples of modern West Africa still wear the colorful textiles, often cotton textiles, patterned textiles, uh, with their myriad uh, displays, uh, that that's, that immediately signal them as among the great sort of artistic and craft uh, labors of of global history, uh, and inspires. Uh, cultural exchange, uh, eventually across the Atlantic through the auspices of the slave trade, but also across uh, Africa itself. Uh, you see a modern day photograph of women in the fabled West African city, the Niger River city of Timbuktu, uh, standing outside uh, an Islamic mosque, and it reminds us of the uh, 
the cosmopolitan nature of West African culture, where in the Niger River you had foreign traders coming from across the Sahara, from from North Africa, from the Arab states, um, camel caravans and desert traders, all the way to the Niger, where uh, textiles, cotton textiles, gold, uh, salt, spices, uh, and even uh, enslaved laborers could be had for the right price, uh, and and thus bringing from the outside world the traditions of the Mediterranean and the Middle East. So Islam, for example, and the religious force of Islam uh, will find its way by the 800s and 900s, centuries before Europeans arrive in Africa, find their way into the councils of the powerful river kingdoms of the Niger River. River towns like Timbuktu connected to trans saharan trade routes, in other words, and the Muslim traders who cross them bring Islamic culture to West Africa, so the great mosque. But, but a mosque that is done not in an Arab style, but in a West African style, with the women, the Muslim women, wearing the West African uh, tradition of cotton-colored textiles. Quite a remarkable integration of traditions. The peoples of West Africa uh, long benefited from a rich diet with good food, one that would uh, have its own influence uh, in the centuries to come on the New World cultures of America. Bananas, for example. Yeah, bananas, a Bantu African word and a native crop of West Africa, something that many Americans uh, to this day will uh, with begin their day uh, and not ever having a sense uh, that this was an African import. West Africa was among the global regions that first developed agriculture. And 3,000 years before the pyramids of Egypt were built, West African women learned to sow, harvest, and cook plants, fruits, nuts, meat, and fish in a variety of ways, including perhaps best known here in the States, the one-pot jambalaya stew. Again, like bananas, jambalaya is an African word, a Bantu word, and a tradition of cooking the one pot stew above an open flame is an African tradition that will come to underlie our own Cajun cuisine uh, and to this day represent one of the great regional cultures of our country. Traditions of respect and authority, West African societies were often both matrilineal and matrilocal, that is, with the woman's family line determining both place of residence and basic authority. And women will play many roles within the West African traditions, including that of wives and mothers, of course, but also political councils, not unlike the Iroquois women, uh, or as spirit mediums, that is, those who could communicate with the ancestral spirits uh, in the spirit world. There were often, often objects of reference in the artistic traditions of their cultures, whether it be hand-carved uh, figures or in the textile arts, women were often impressed as symbols of reverence as symbols of fertility, of sexual potency, of authority, of imagination. And like Native American women, African women, West African women in particular across their diverse cultures would find themselves at the center of a new Atlantic world. Uh, the great uh, and tragic story of the Atlantic slave trade is something that we will catch up with uh, in uh, lectures to come. Uh, but suffice it to say for now that those women who were made a part of the uh, Atlantic uh, network will bring with them, even as they come in chains, will bring with them the traditions of their forebears and their cultures and thus will make an unmistakable imprint on the developing New World societies of the Americas. Okay, that's it for now for part two. Thank you very much. We will continue on uh, soon with the next of our lectures on women's history in America.